On today's episode of Locked On Suns, that win over Denver was so nice. We need two shows on it. We'll talk about how the Suns were built specifically to beat the Nuggets with five different examples. Let's go. You are Locked On Suns, your daily Phoenix Suns podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. We are back. This is Locked On Phoenix Suns. We are part of the Locked On Podcast Network. I'm your host, Brendan Clean, a credentialed media member covering the Suns for the past seven seasons. I am also a writer at Dime Magazine, the host of the Just Basketball Show, wherever you get your podcasts. And I create written and video content exclusive for the Locked On Suns insider community, which you can sign up for at the link in the show description below. Thank you for making Locked On Suns your first listen here on This Thursday night into Friday morning. Wherever you're finding us, please hit follow or subscribe. Maybe it's your first time hearing the show or you just never bothered to do it before. Either way, go ahead and hit that button. Get a new episode in your feed every single Monday through Friday. Become an everydayer and get locked down to the Phoenix Suns all season long and beyond really into the offseason. All of that good stuff. Today's show brought to you by the FanDuel Sportsbook. Make every moment more. Right now, new customers get $200 in bonus bets with any winning $5 bet. That's $200 if your bet wins. Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on to get started. Okay. So, this is a point I've been wanting to make for a while, and the games against the Nuggets have been so intense that I have not had the opportunity to do so. But... It's time. We need to remember, as we celebrate this win over the Nuggets, the second one in the month, and another road win, another mostly healthy win on both sides, with at least the the best player on each team, we'll say, healthy, that this Suns team was built specifically to beat the Nuggets. That is the whole thing. I said that in the offseason as it was happening, I said it going into the preseason when we were doing predictions and guessing how far this team could get and everything else. This team was eliminated by Denver in the playoffs and they put their head down in the offseason and they said, let's beat that team next time. They correctly evaluated that that was going to be, well, I'm not going to say a dynasty. Let's not get ahead of ourselves, but the team to beat in the West. And so... A lot of the things they did were done with that in mind. Starting with building a team centered on offense, right? It's not a coincidence that the other connection between these two teams all season has been the fact that every time we have tried to say, can the Suns win the title? Can a team built this way? Can a team with these statistical indicators win the championship? Every single time we have looked at the Nuggets and said, well, they did it. Their defense was mediocre. They went on to win a championship. The Suns are similar because they are being built to beat that team. That should not come as a surprise. You look at the playoffs last year in the second round, the two games the Suns won, game three, game four, yes, both at home, sure, you can point to that, but also games in which the Suns scored 120 plus points. The only games that the Suns scored more than 110 points and they were able to get those offensive explosions They weathered the storm of a 53-point game in Game 4 by Nikola Jokic. And they win. Yes, I think they could have won Game 2 if Chris Paul doesn't get hurt and there's all these what-ifs you can say, but at the bottom, but the end of the day is the Suns won the games where they had big offensive output. So they get Bradley Beal, they switch DeAndre Ayton out for a more offensively-minded center and a sharpshooting specialist in Grayson Allen and on down the line. And obviously, you expect the Suns, much more even than last year, to be able to keep pace from a scoring standpoint with the Nuggets, right? Look a little bit closer, though, right, at the ways in which the Nuggets are effective, the way they beat you, what they're good at, the possession game. In last year's playoffs, the Suns 
were at a disadvantage when it came to offensive rebounding and free throw rate in a big way on both sides. And this year, with Durant, with Booker, with Beal, the Suns are a pretty good free throw team in terms of how many they're able... They're number one, right? Because the the 76ers have fallen off in that category a bit with Embiid out. The Suns are the top team in free throw rate in the NBA. They are also now top 10 in offensive rebounding, which I believe they were last year too, but rather than like Torrey Craig and Josh Okoge crashing from the weak side and whatnot, it is actually Nikola uh, Yusuf Nurkic and Drew Eubanks and legitimate bigs and whatnot who are getting those opportunities. And so the Suns are not going to lose the possession game so long as they can clean up the turnovers, which is obviously a separate conversation, but that is, I wouldn't say solely to beat Denver. You want to get to the line. You want to get offensive rebounds no matter which team you're playing, but it was clearly... It was staring them in the face after that Nugget series, and they went and cleaned it up to double down with Nurkic once again. It's not just that Nurkic gets up for the Jokic matchup, although that's nice. More specifically, I think the Suns realized that they needed a bigger, more physical, more tough, more willing to sacrifice center than what they had. So they get Nurkic who I think has more than proven himself to be the type of guy who can go out and get 20, even 30 rebounds in some in some of these games, can, you know, give maximum effort and embrace his role even when he's only taking five shots. And I think that clearly was done. You know, that wasn't done to match up better with the Clippers, certainly, or the Warriors or the Mavericks. Those are teams that Aiton has been successful against that, you know, do a very different type of thing. To go get Nurkic and say, that's going to be our starting 30-minute-a-game center, you do that if you think the reigning finals MVP, the two-time MVP before that, is the guy you need to beat. I would even go so far as to say the coaching decision. It, again, these things are not solely done. It's not like they interview Frank Vogel and they say, what's your game plan to beat Denver? If you have the best one, you get the job. Of course not. But what are the things that Frank Vogel is best at? Scheming a defense. Coaching, transition defense, and emphasizing that. Creating a freedom for his best players on the offensive end. Which... I think, would point to a playoff offense that can keep up with the Nuggets, right? So, hey, we know we don't have the best defensive personnel, but we need to beat a pretty sophisticated offense with a great one-on-one player. Let's get a coach who's going to be able to do that. Now, you could say Nick Nurse would have been similar in that capacity. Maybe he was always going to Philadelphia. You could maybe have your particular favorite. Maybe you think Doc Rivers and his veteran experience is a better fit. I don't know. Point is... Vogel checked a lot of the boxes that you would want the Suns to check in a Nuggets matchup. And I think beating them twice and nearly beating them that third time in December proves that a lot of these answers have have worked, right? And so Bradley Beal says last night after the game, what did he learn from, from this season series? What does he feel like the Suns have proven by having success? He said they're beatable. But to a lot of teams, they're not beatable. And they are beatable by the Suns, as we've seen, in large part because they came off of that disappointment last May and they said, this is the team we need to prove ourselves against. This is the measuring stick. Let's get to work. Next, we saw some positive minutes from Thaddeus Young, the Suns, only buyout signing is the answer to their problems their inconsistencies more thad young or is the answer a little more complicated we'll get into that next 
First, today's show brought to you by eBay Motors. Passion, drive, and patience. What brings home the winning trophy is also what keeps your ride or die alive. eBay Motors has everything you need to maintain your vehicle and level it up to peak performances. From superchargers, roof racks, exhaust kits, LED headlights, and more, whether you're into speed, power, or style, eBay Motors has got you covered. I've really become an eBay guy in the past couple of years. eBay Motors, tons of other stuff as well, but the cars, they really have it figured out. Over, over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die. And with eBay Guaranteed Fit, your part is guaranteed to fit your ride every time or your money back. You put your car in, it tells you if this thing's going to work. That's exactly what you need instead of scrolling through a bunch of other websites hoping. Because with eBay Motors, you're burning rubber, not cash. With all the parts you need at the prices you want, it's easy to turn your car into the MVP and bring home that win. So keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only, exclusions apply. eBay Guaranteed Fit only available to U.S. customers. All righty, let's keep it rolling here. Thaddeus Young, 18 minutes, six points, nine rebounds, plus 15 in the box score against Denver. I'm torn on this, right? Because a couple of things have happened since the Suns signed Thad Young that I want to just establish first before we have an in-depth discussion about him. One is... Bull Bull has continued to develop, has continued to prove himself as somebody that at the bare minimum can come in, play 10 or so minutes, and do some positive things. Stay afloat on defense, maybe make a couple of rim protection plays or defer, deter shots at the basket, maybe stay with somebody out on the perimeter, offensively knock down his shots, keep the ball moving, do his thing. So that gave the Suns one more steady hand off of the bench. The other thing that they've done that's happened, I guess you would say, is that they've, I think, slowly but surely figured out better ways to utilize Drew Eubanks, right? I think they're figuring out that either he needs to be defending the pick and roll in basically like a hedge or a drop coverage, not switching, not a deep drop where he can be blown by or be foul prone or whatever, or he needs to be off ball guarding somebody that he can play kind of free safety against and be a help defender like Aaron Gordon, for instance, or pick your non-shooter on an opposing team. Offensively, don't give the ball to him on the short roll. It's kind of the DeAndre Ayton rules on offense. Don't make him have to think with the ball in his hands. Don't ask him to do too much. Don't put him in a position to turn it over or force a pass or force a shot that he can't successfully take on. So those two things gave the Suns two more front court players that have been impactful for them, meaning that you have heard me, if you're an everyday or listening to this show, spend a lot less time clamoring for Thaddeus Young to get minutes. If you want my breakdown of Thaddeus Young's minutes, you can check out the watch back video that I did of the third quarter of Suns Nuggets, where I broke it down start to finish for Locked on Suns Insiders. I sent it directly to their phones. Only they have access to it. That is not content that every Locked On Suns listener or watcher got. If you would like to get it in the future, I will be doing one after the Thunder game, which we'll talk about in the next segment. And hopefully every game down the stretch, because they're all going to be big. You can sign up at joinsubtext.com slash Locked On Suns or visit the link in the show description below. You type your phone number in. You have to confirm in order to actually be added to the mailing list. And every thought that I have on game days about what's going on in the games or updates on injuries, as well as those videos and much, much more and news and rumors galore when we get to the off season, that's where you'll sign up. When I went back and watched those minutes and broke down the third quarter when Thad Young played a big role, yes, clearly as a screener, as a decision maker with the ball in his hands, he is a big help, but we knew that. Two assists, I didn't even mention when I listed off his box score, zero turnovers. So yeah, if you need somebody, you know, to catch the ball on the roll and make the right pass, if you need somebody to kind of be the guy freeing others up as a screener away from the ball, yes, he can do that. If you want to dump it off to somebody in the elbow to kind of get things going, fill a little bit of that Nurkic control, Thaddeus Young can do that. None of that's a surprise, though, right? 
At the same time, the other trend that I think we've noticed in the stretch run of the season is the small ball look for the Suns is only going to be deployed in very select circumstances. Obviously certain teams, but even within that, really it's not going to be for long periods of time. You know, we've seen it against two in two fourth quarters against the Kings, for instance. We've seen it in these moments where the Suns need to come back. They're down uh, big and they want to go all offense, but it's not stable enough. It's not big enough. It's not athletic enough. The Suns don't have enough options where that look is really going to work at the highest levels. So the same can be said of Thaddeus Young being out there because he is not He's not a pure center. He's not a traditional center. I mean, this guy played small forward for the Sixers when he get, when he came into the NBA, right? So he's 6'8". He has decent wingspan, but, you know, 6'8". Not an elite athlete, and also, at this point, certainly far from his athletic peak at age 35. So, the point is here, could he be part of a small ball unit to give it a little bit more size. Okay. I could be convinced maybe instead of it just being Durant and a bunch of guards effectively, maybe Thad Young could fill the Eric Gordon role or the Grayson Allen role in some of those lineups around the big three. And those lineups get a little bit bigger. Okay. Sure. I could see it. But lineups where Thad is the biggest guy on the court are not going to regularly happen. No matter how he's used, if he is sort of a center next to Durant, if he is a power forward maybe on bench units, I don't know. Whatever it is, whether he plays and how impactful he is is going to be 100% dependent on what he can do on the defensive end. Can he hold up on switches? Can the Suns go into it, just switch everything scheme when he's out there? Can he makes some help defensive plays, you know, dig in on a drive and get a, you know, deflection or get a steal. Can he rotate over and be a helper at the basket? Can he defend in the post like he did a couple of times against Nikola Jokic? Adding up the, a greater number of those defensive, solid defensive plays on the ball, team defender, help, rim protection, whatever. That's going to be what defines if if Thad Young has anything to say with this Suns team as a real contributor. And it's not going to be every matchup, every night, every series. Minnesota, not really a place for Thad Young because they have one or at least usually two of Gobert, Towns, and Reed on the court at all times. Not a great place for Thaddeus Young to end up. I could give more examples, right? But there will be some when he can, and it's going to depend on how much he can do on the defensive end. Coming up next, I will look at the rest of this road trip, give you what to watch for in Oklahoma City, in New Orleans, as the Suns wrap up this five-game, one last big road trip of the season. But first... Today's show brought to you by Nissan. Are you the kind of driver that likes to push things a little further? Do you ever wonder what adventure could be around the next corner? Well, our friends at Nissan have a lineup of SUVs with the capability to take your adventure to the next level. The 2024 Nissan Rogue is perfect for city drives and great escapes. Class exclusive Google built in is your always updating assistant to call on for almost anything and gone are the days of connecting your phone. Google Assist and Google Maps and Google Play Store are built right into the 12.3-inch HD touchscreen infotainment system, all combining to make the 2024 Rogue the perfect midsize crossover for your next adventure. Nissan's incredible lineup also includes the 2024 Nissan Pathfinder, which has room up to eight, an expansive cargo capacity, and advanced available 4x4 capability with 284 horsepower and up to to 6,000 pounds towing, when Adventure Calls, the Pathfinder is there to answer. Take 
the Nissan Rogue, Nissan Pathfinder, or Nissan Armada, and go find your next big adventure. Shop NissanUSA.com. Closing out the show. The Suns are in New Orleans. Oklahoma City on Friday. New Orleans on Monday. It doesn't end there. Obviously, they have Cleveland with Donovan Mitchell looming and Minnesota, New Orleans, two games against the Clippers in Sacramento and in Minnesota one more time to close out the season. But let's just take it one day at a time. The Thunder are the Suns' kryptonite. And there's no easy way around that. However, the Suns may have caught a break. Shea Gilgis-Alexander is doubtful. Yusuf Nurkic is questionable. So one of the strengths the Suns had in that last matchup was the glass. Nurkic just piled up rebound after rebound. They won't have that, but obviously you take it with OKC being without their best player. Nevertheless, I think it's pretty clear why the Thunder pose such an issue for the Suns. They have the type of defensive personnel with Lou Dort and Jalen Williams and obviously Shea when he's in there and even Chet Holmgren to shrink the floor, to play physically one-on-one, and to get the Suns out of their groove on offense. However, I think we have seen some very solid ball movement and flow games from the Suns since they lost to Oklahoma City the last time. So, I don't think they should overlook OKC without Shea, but... I do think even if Shea was playing, I would feel like the Suns should be able to be more competitive with this team than they have in the past. The other thing to add on to minus the defensive personnel or aside from the defensive personnel that makes this such a difficult matchup is the Suns are a small team and not always the most attentive defensive team, meaning that the Thunders drive and kick offensive attack where they are constantly getting dribble penetration, trying to get to the line, trying to get fouls, or trying to get um, layups and dunks, interior shots, and then spraying out to shooters, getting you into rotation, moving the ball off of that. It's, It's basic. It is predictable. But the Thunder have really perfected it, and it's something that the Suns struggle to keep up with given that again they're small so they're not going to you know they're going to be at a little bit of a disadvantage like we saw even on against denver where grayson allen for instance is closing out against the michael porter jr three it's going to be similar with you know not quite the height differential but a williams or a giddy they also don't have the help defense at the basket to make life difficult for williams when he gets in there and at least make him make a, a, a heavily contested floater or a you know tough layup through contact. The Suns aren't really that type of a defense. So don't overlook this team. What I think will defi- decide this game is if the Suns can cycle through offensive options with flow, with purpose, and keep the ball popping. What we saw in that Cleveland game, for instance, would be an ideal outcome where everybody's involved, everybody is initiating, but they're able to attack weak points for Oklahoma City. They're able to keep what's working, working, and they're unpredictable, you know, spontaneous, as Kevin Durant has said, purposefully random, as I've said. That is what I think will will win. And they also just have to bring it minute one to minute 48. The Thunder are relentless. They're physical. They're athletic. That in and of itself is a challenge for the Suns too. So you need to be awake and ready for that game. A sleepy first quarter, for instance, is not going to work well. A bad fourth quarter when Jalen Williams tends to really come alive is not going to work well. The Thunder have only lost one game in overtime all year, and it was in their last game. So you can bet that they are going to be hungry as well, not just Phoenix. They're chasing a one seed. This game matters to them too. 
New Orleans is very interesting. I watched most of their game against the Bucks on Thursday night before I'm recording this, and obviously you want to see can Beal duplicate what he did at times getting the Zion matchup. But even aside from that, it takes a whole defense to defend the Pelicans because Zion is going to be a threat to get to the basket, so you need to have a plan there. Are you, you know, helping off of somebody specific? Are you loading up on one side and mapping out your rotations off of that? Are you switching up who is defending whom so that you can get the right guys in position to contest at the rim or to, you know, be the low man helper or whatever? All that game plan stuff is going to be big, as it always is against the Pelicans. That is a great three-point shooting team for a lot of the reasons I just mentioned, but we know that can be a a sticking point, a, a weak point for the Suns. Point of attack wise, obviously Zion is somewhat of a point of attack problem, but CJ McCollum can heat up. That is defensively the issue. As for the other end, I think you worry about. Well, Ingram's out. So I, I would expect, I think, first and foremost, for this to be a another opportunity for Kevin Durant. I would guess that Zion probably guards him. Zion has done a lot better moving his feet, embracing one-on-one matchups. I thought for a lot of the game against Orlando the other night, he did a pretty decent job against Paolo Bancaro, for instance. But... We know KD will have answers. KD has a height advantage. But if Zion can sort of use his physicality and the Pelicans can send help, well, that starts to get a little closer to what we've seen Denver and Golden State and Boston be able to do to disrupt Durant's rhythm, force him into some bobbled catches and lost dribbles and things like that. That's what I would guess we see. And at that point, from there, it just becomes, okay, if Herb Jones is trying to, you know, fight through screens and force Booker out of his spots, force him into tough mid-range shots, things like that, they have a game plan against Durant. Well, you know what that means, right? It becomes, what can Beal do? How can the Suns scheme him into some good looks? And then just spot-up wise, can Grayson Allen feast? Can the Suns push tempo would be another question for me. The Pelicans are a good transition team. Can... The Suns keep up with that. Can they actually, you know, get some offense going their own way when it comes to fast break opportunities? That's some of what I would look like there. Look at there. My mentality, if I'm the Suns, is steal one of these games. End of a road trip. Big win against Denver. You could see Friday being a letdown game. Shea being out and you overlook it and all that stuff. But win one. Win one. I mean, you, you need to win as many as you can, but realistically, okay, so maybe not if I'm the Suns, but if I'm me, I would be satisfied with one win here. You come back home. Cleveland is a team you just handled. They're going to be reintegrating Mitchell. You're at, again, you're, you're at home. That should matter. And you take it from there. But win one of these. You feel pretty good about where you're at. And you see where the chips fall. That'll wrap us up for the week. Don't forget to sign up for the Locked on Suns Insiders to get video analysis of both of these games, my takeaways in real time from those games, any injury updates or anything else that happens news-wise with this Suns team, all of that sent directly to your phone. That, again, is at joinsubtext.com slash LockedOnSuns or at the link in the show description below. That'll be the best way to keep up through the weekend in the meantime or and at which point we will have another episode with brandon duenas we'll have recaps of all these games as they come as you know so hit follow subscribe on the show feed as well and i will catch you guys next week